Ruth was of uh, what nationality? Moabite. Now, where did the Moabites come from? And don't say Moab. Beyond Moab, where, where did the Moabites originate? They originated with Lot. Uh, when Lot and his family left Sodom and Gomorrah, of course, we know his wife looked back and turned into a pillar of salt. And Lot and his daughters did not stop at the place they had kind of uh, negotiated with the angels that they could go to and not have to go so far. But when they saw the destruction, it scared them so badly. I guess the, the adrenaline kicked in. They went farther and they looked down on the destruction of the whole Sodom and Gomorrah area. And the daughters concluded that it was the end of the world. And they were the only three people living left in the world. So they decided, we've got to do something to ensure that the, the seed of man goes on. So the oldest one uh, had her father drink wine, had relations with him. She conceived her younger daughter, the, her younger sister, the very next night did the same thing. Two children were born. One, uh, ben Ami, which became the father of the Ammonites. And then the other one named Moab, the father of the Moabites. So the, the Moabites were uh, a nation, like Ammon, born uh, by incest. And so you can imagine how things would progress from there. Uh, the Moabites always had a little problem with, well, we'll just say they had problems. But Ruth is a Moabitess. There's a man that uh, was named Elimelech. His wife was named Naomi. And because of a famine in the land, they moved to Moab. And by moving to Moab, the, the boys met their prospective wives there. And it just so happened that Elimelech died in that land, but also both of the sons died in Moab. Naomi has nothing now to keep her there. And by now, the famine is probably over in Israel. So she returns, makes plans to return to Israel. Her two daughters-in-law, Orpah and Ruth, decided that they would go with her. And Naomi reasoned with both of them and said, why, why would you follow me? I, don't have, I have no chance of having other children. Naomi's thinking about the, the Israelites' law, the leveret law of marriage, where if a, if a man married a woman, and that he died before they had any children, his next kin closest to him would take her for a wife, and the child that they would have, the first child they would have, would become the inheritor of his brother's property. And I'm sure Naomi's thinking along this line, so she talks with both of them, and when she does talk with both of them and telling them they need to go home, they need to find somebody nice and marry, they need to go to their family and their gods. Uh, Orpah, in verse 14, kisses her mother-in-law goodbye. But Ruth hung on. Ruth clung to her. She's hanging on. She's not going to leave. And Naomi tries to reason with her, saying, you know, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people, her gods. You know, go with her. And then Ruth says something that you have probably heard many times in weddings. Do not urge me to leave you or turn back from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. Thus may the Lord do to me, and worse, if anything but death parts you and me. And you can see why that would be an appropriate thing to read at a wedding. But the original context is, this is a young lady and her mother-in-law. And we don't know a lot about Ruth. We don't know her family background. We don't know if her mother was living. Uh, we don't know if her mother was, was one that Ruth was close to. Apparently, uh, Ruth felt closest at this point to Naomi. And so there's many things that could explain that. We just don't know which one is the right avenue to explain that. But she is determined to follow Naomi, her mother-in-law. You know, have a lot of mother-in-law jokes uh, going around. I, I used to tell people that Carol's mother ruined mother-in-law jokes for me because she fit none of the 
characteristics of the traditional mother-in-law. She was so sweet, she was nice, she was helpful, she was everything good, and I said I didn't get to use any of my mother-in-law jokes on her. But at any rate, Naomi apparently was someone like this, and that she instilled a sense of loyalty on the part of Ruth. Now, why would Ruth follow Naomi? You know, what would she hope to gain by it if she cannot have any children, you know, or if she is not looking forward to someone Naomi would give birth to and marry him, and it's not her land. Why would she go? Just her love for Ruth? She doesn't want to see her make the trip alone. She doesn't want to see her live in the land alone. What what happened to most widows in that time? They they had to beg for the most part. They uh, there was no system in place to support widows. There's a blessing from God for those who do help the widows, the fatherless, and so on. But there's no system in there, and she doesn't know what she's going back to really. And so Ruth is not going to let her go by herself. Uh, she's tenacious. She's she's going to launch out into the unknown. She's going to a land that she's never been. And so she goes with Naomi. Naomi gets home. The family all meets her. And they say, here's Naomi. And she said, don't call me Naomi anymore. Uh, Naomi is a word that means pleasant. She says, call me Mara. Mara is a word that means bitter. And not that she was bitter so much as she said, the Lord has dealt bitterly toward me. In, in Israel... The, the main idea was God treated people the way they deserved to be treated. So if you were sickly, if you were lame, if you were poor, it's because you've got it coming. That, uh, you know, remember in John chapter 9, Jesus sent his disciples to see a man who was born blind. Now that's, that's a, a quandary for them. Here's a man born blind. Well, it doesn't fit quite fit the category of somebody who sins so badly that God smites him with blindness. But they debate it. Maybe God knew this guy was going to be so bad that he started punishing him in advance. That might be what happened. Others said, well, no, it's his parents that are being punished by having a blind, a blind child. And so the debate went on, and the disciples of Jesus asked him the question. Who was it that sinned, this man or his parents, that he would be born blind? And uh, Jesus said, neither. It's not so much what happened to him in, in life. What really matters is how we respond to that, what we do for him. So Naomi is, is talking about really what the prevailing notion was at their time, that she had done something so bad that she was responsible for losing her husband and both of her sons, that God would afflict her. Now, she does not do like Job. Job tries to figure it out, just exactly what it was, and examines his life. Naomi does not go to that trouble. Jesus, she just says, this is from the Lord. He's afflicted me, so you might as well just call me bitter. Now, chapter 2 gets into a, a husband uh, or kinsman of her husband, related to Elimelech, a man of great wealth, and his name was Boaz. Before Boaz, or before Naomi and Ruth came to the land, you know what, Bo what Boaz was? He was ruthless. Okay, toss in a joke, just see who's awake, who's not. If you groaned, you're awake. Okay. Now, Boaz... Is, is told in advance here, he's going to figure into the story. So the writer is just introducing him to us in verse 1. Ruth has a plan for taking care of Naomi. She's going to go and glean among the ears of grain wherever she can find someone that will let her. Now, what, what is gleaning? Okay, the men go in and they harvest. And then the gleaners go back and they pick up what's left, what's on the ground, what the guys, the guys are in there trying to get as much as they can, as quickly as they can, and, and some of it falls to the ground. 
And the gleaners go in and get it. This is something God had uh, told the people to do. He said, yes, when, when you harvest your fields, uh, don't go back and glean your fields. Don't harvest the corners. Uh, leave that for the poor. The reality of it was what happened in their day was that when the gleaners came in and gleaned, the men who owned the property would have their servants waiting for them. And after they finished gleaning, they would take most of what these people had gleaned. It's kind of like a tax, you might say, an, an illegal tax in God's eyes, but they did it nonetheless. And very oftentimes, those who were gleaning were the very poor or the elderly, and that kind of invited abuse as well. Uh, they would beat them, they would rob them, they would uh, treat them horribly. But Ruth is going to risk that. She's going to go in, she's going to try to find someone that might show her some favor. And so she goes into, happens to go into the field belonging to Boaz, and Boaz comes in to greet his servants. And, and it sounds like this is a traditional deal with them. Greets them in the morning, may the Lord be with you. And then they answer, may the Lord bless you. And then he sees Ruth. He asks them, whose young woman is this? And they explained to him and said that she had asked us if she could glean here and gather after the reapers. And she said, he, they told her, they told him, verse 7, she, has, she came and she has remained from the morning until now. And right now she's sitting in the house for a little while. She's resting. So Boaz goes to Ruth. He finds out what she's been doing, and he respects that very much. He is uh, amazed at uh, her dedication to Naomi. And so he instructs Ruth to not go into any other field, stay there, and uh, to stay with my maids. Let your eyes be on the field which they reap. Go after them. I've commanded the servants not to touch you. When you're thirsty, go to the water jars. Drink from where the servants draw. This is, a, this is a tremendous kindness out of step with what people were used to in those days. And Ruth recognizes this, falls on her face, and wants to know why he's treating her, a stranger, a foreigner, uh, so well. And Boaz tells her, I've heard about you. I know what you've been doing. And... Uh, he said, may God reward your work and your wages be full from the Lord, the God of Israel, and who, under whose wings you have come to seek refuge. And so he, she thanks him. And at the mealtime meal in verse 14, he makes special uh, accommodations for her to eat. She sits beside the reapers. Uh, she is served just in the way that they are. When she gets up to leave, the reapers understand, you know, now, notice this, that the reapers working for Boaz, these are also outstanding people. Uh, they, they have taken a hint from Boaz and his leadership, so they're, they're following after him. They're the ones who gave her permission. They've been leaving her alone until this time. They know she's been resting in the house. That's something else uh, that was accorded to her, not normal for that time. And when she left... He told them, let her glean even among the sheaves and do not insult her. In other words, wherever she wants to go to, to glean, you let her do that. And then leave some grain from the bundles out on purpose. You know, do, do this, make it easier on her. Make it where she's going to glean more and have more at the end of the day. I remember a story one time of a... Uh, Y'all remember the pot bottles you used to turn in for refunds on the deposits? Any of y'all old enough to remember that? Okay. I remember when they were two cents for the, for the deposit. Then they went up to nickel. Some places they went up to a dime. They went to three cents first. They went to three cents first. Well, I'm skipping steps because I'm short of time. Anyway, uh, no, I'm kidding. Anyway, they, they were doing this, and I remember my cousins had cases that they had bought and just left for a long time. And when it went from two cents to a nickel, they took them and cashed, cashed them in, made the store clerk really angry at them. But at any rate, people used to go along the roads and gather up pop bottles that were not broken, 
had been thrown out, thrown out along the road. And there was a woman driving along, and she sees this guy. He's an older guy, and he's kind of stove over a little bit. And he's getting these bottles, and she drives a little bit ahead of him, and she's chunking these bottles out into a grassy area right in front of a highway patrolman. He pulls her over, and he said, Ma'am, you're not allowed to throw things out on the highway. That's called littering. She said, Well, officer, I saw this guy gathering up bottles. I didn't want to insult him. I wanted to let him do this on his own. And so I was tossing these out, knowing he's going to be coming up here just really soon to get the bottles. And he said, I, I, I appreciate your intentions, but I can't let you do that. And she said, Okay, I'll, I'll stop doing that. And she drove on, and she looked in her rearview mirror. She drove on, and the highway patrolman was looking like this, and he took the bottle and tossed it out in the grass. So uh, anyway, that's the same sort of, of uh, kindness that Boaz told them to show Ruth. She gleaned about an ephah of barley that was much more than, than what was expected. Uh, Naomi is surprised after she comes out, comes back, and they, they both eat and they're satisfied. She told her where she had gleaned and uh, that the man's name that owned the field was Boaz. And Naomi pronounces a blessing on him and tells him, he is one of our closest relatives. Stay close. Uh, Ruth said, he told me to stay close to the servants till they finished all the harvest. She said, it's good that you go out with a maze let someone else fall upon you in another field. So she stayed with him, and she lived with her mother-in-law till the end of the barley harvest. Now, in chapter 3, Naomi cannot resist playing the part of matchmaker. How many, how many of you have seen Fiddler on the Roof? One of the, one of the more well-known songs in the Fiddler on the Roof is what? Matchmaker, matchmaker. Make me a match. Da, 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 so make me a catch. I forget all the words. But at any rate, uh, it's kind of a tradition in the Jewish families. Have a matchmaker. And Naomi's going to play the part here. And now she tells uh, Ruth how to go about this. Now, I don't know what kind of conversation went on before now. If she's going to assume that Ruth would be looking for a husband and would be happy with Boaz. But at any rate, she tells him, or tells Ruth, what to do to basically lay her claim to the leveret law of marriage. So he's win he's, he winnows barley at the threshing floor tonight. Wash yourself, anoint yourself, put on your clothes. In, in most translations, it says best Clothes. The word best is not there, but that's implied. Go down to the threshing floor, but don't make yourself known to him until he's finished eating and drinking. And when he lies down, you'll notice the place where he lies down. You go and uncover his feet and lie down, and he will tell you what you shall do. Why would she uncover his feet? It'd be a sign of submission. Uh, it would also be a sign of I'm wanting to put myself under you. So uh, that that's kind of there's there's a lot of tradition here. There's a lot of things that are in Scripture. They had a certain way of doing things, and this is one of the ways that a woman who's a widow could lay claim to the lever law of marriage. So she does that, and he has eaten and he's drunk. His heart was merry. He was happy. He was relaxed. He'd had a little bit to drink. Uh, we're not told he got drunk, but enough to, to get rested. Uh, I probably have not told all of you all of this. I hope you don't think less of me for it, but uh, my father used to drink. He'd drink one beer at supper time. Now, my dad was skinny. You, you think, I'm skinny? My, my dad weighed 140 pounds when he was 40 years old. So, kind of give you a little bit of idea there. I was past that by the time I was 40. Not much, but I was. But at any rate, the doctors told him, drink some beer. Uh, the food value in it will help you to gain weight. So he would have one, and it also helped him to rest at night. 
And, and I watched my dad do this every night. Opened up a can of Falstaff, poured it into one of those uh, jelly jars that we reclaimed as a drinking glass after we finished with the jelly. And uh, I would go up to him when I was about four years old and, and going on five and ask for a drink. And he would tell me no. And the next night I would ask him for a drink. Can I have some? Can I have some? You know how irritating kids can be when they get their eyes set on something, your heart set on something? I was that. So I kept begging for a drink. Unbeknownst to me, my parents got together and they said, what are we going to do? <laughs> David keeps wanting a drink. My mom later told me it's fitting because when she was pregnant with me, she craved beer. She never touched it, but she craved it. But at any rate, they, they agreed one time, we'll pour him a little bit, he won't like it, and then it'll be over with. So they poured me a little bit, I loved it, and then they said, what are we going to do now? So what happened was, to make a short story long, my dad changed jobs, and when he changed jobs, he took a big pay cut so he could be at home every night. He was in the oil industry and was making good money, but he took a pay cut, worked for the city, and once he made that change, he couldn't afford his one beer a night. Everything was taken up. So I quit drinking when I was five. <laughs> you tell everybody, hey, our preacher used to drink. He quit when he was five. But at any rate, Boaz is all relaxed, and in the middle of the night, he wakes up, and there's a woman lying at his feet. And so he wants to know what's going on. She, he said, who are you? She said, I'm Ruth, your maid. So spread your covering over your maid, for you are a close relative, called a redeemer or near kinsman. Boaz's response shows his willingness here to honor this. He said, may you be blessed of the Lord, my daughter. You've shown your last kindness to be better than the first by not going after young men, whether poor or rich. So it hints that Boaz is not a young man here. He said, don't fear, I'll do whatever you ask, because all the people of the city know you are a woman of excellence. Here's a woman that's a Moabitess, a people that are usually at odds with Israel, sometimes considered enemies. And in a very short time, she has developed a reputation in a city in Israel as a woman of excellence. That says so much about her. He said, you remain this night. When morning comes, I'll redeem you if, uh, excuse me, he tells her there is somebody closer than he is, relative-wise. There's somebody who somehow is, is a little bit closer to being a relative of Elimelech than he is, and he's going to make sure, see if this person wants to redeem her. And he said, remain this night, morning comes, if he will redeem you, good. Let him redeem you. In other words, it's going to be up to him legally. But if he doesn't, I will redeem you as the Lord lives. Lie down till morning. And then he sends her away and he uh, says to her, let it not be, or tells his servants, don't let anyone know she came here. And anyway, he gives her some grain to take back with her. And when she tells Naomi what's happened in verse 18, Naomi said, wait until you know how the matter turns out for the man will not rest until he has settled it today. He talked about Ruth's reputation as a woman of excellence. Here's Boaz's reputation. He is a person who gets things done. He doesn't put them off. He doesn't put people off. He will see to it. So Boaz goes up to the gate of the city, sits down there, and when this closer relative comes, Boaz begins to explain the situation to him. Naomi, who came back from the land of Moab, has to sell a piece of land that belonged to our brother Elimelech. So I thought to inform you, saying it, saying, buy it before those who are sitting here and before the elders of my people. If you redeem it, redeem it. But if not, tell me that I may know there's no one but you to redeem it, and I'm after you. And this closer relative says, I'll redeem it. And Boaz says, oh, footnote. On the day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you must also acquire Ruth, 
the Moabitess, the widow of the deceased, in order to raise up the name of the deceased on his inheritance. And the close relative said, I cannot redeem it for myself lest I jeopardize my own inheritance. Redeem it yourself, you may have my right of redemption, for I cannot redeem it. Now he thought he's going to get a really good deal on some lambs. And this is the other relative. This is the man that Ruth would really not want to marry anyway. He thought he's going to get some land cheap. But then when he finds out the situation there, he knows that if he has children with Ruth, that property goes to that child and it stays in the family of Elimelech, not with his family. So he backs off. And when he backs off, verse 7 tells us there was a custom concerning redemption and the exchange of land to confirm a matter, a man removed his sandal and gave it to another. This was the manner of attestation in Israel. So the closest relative said, buy it for yourself, and he removed his sandal. And that everybody witnessed this, and Boaz is going to take her as his wife. Now, this, this was not just a tradition. This was a command of God. The only thing is, Israel has kind of softened what God actually said to do. God said this, a man is to take his brother's wife and raise up seed. If he refuses for any reason, the woman that he's refused shall take a sandal off his foot and spit in his face and then say, thus it shall be done for anyone who does not follow the command of the Lord. Well, there's, there's no spitting in his face and this has become kind of a Okay, you just you just lost your shoes. Well, no, you only say he only lost one sandal. Then he lost them both. He's not gonna walk around with one sandal. You know, so if you lose one shoe, how many of you walk around with that shoe on only? So he's he's lost his shoes. He's got to go get some more sandals, and that's symbolic in Israel uh, of ownership there as well. But at any rate, Boaz has uh, kind of negotiated this guy to get what Boaz wanted in the first place, and that was Ruth to follow after uh, re, uh, honoring the Leverett law of marriage. But through all of this, we're going we're to finish this up next week, Lord willing. You, you look at what Ruth did. She's willing to leave everything she knew because of her dedication and love for Naomi leaves her family, to take care of someone else. And, and that's her main goal, to take care of Naomi, to work hard so that Naomi is fed, and uh, to work hard enough to make enough money that Naomi doesn't have to move out uh, of her house. And in the process of doing everything she can to make sure that Naomi has what she must have, Ruth is going to end up getting everything she could ever hope for. And I think there's a really strong message in there for all of us. And, you know, something that we need to be telling our kids about. Here's, here's what happens when you and I follow God and we make another person more important than ourselves. When we take care of them, God's going to take care of us. And, and we know that that's a promise but this is one of those examples that sets it out really easy to see it. It's an excellent illustration of that happening just the right way. And we also see God's role in all of this. You know, she doesn't just happen to go into anyone's field. She goes into Boaz's field. Imagine that. And Boaz notices her. And, and, and then he's, he, well, it goes on from there. But you know, I, I think God has a hand in so many things we don't realize. Real quickly, did I tell you how Carol and I met? Her church came over to Cushing to door knock for a campaign, a gospel meeting. And I was working in town for a, while, for a uh, pipeline company. And the first day they were going to knock doors, we got rained out. Big rain came in the morning, we couldn't work. So I went back home, changed clothes, and went down to the church building, and they had not left out yet to go door knocking because of the rain. And they said, we're going to need another person to door knock. Carol's partner got sick this morning, and 
he couldn't door knock with her. Well, there was another Carol there, and I thought it was her. But it wasn't. It was the Carol you know. So she and I went out, and that's how we met. We went out all day and knocked doors, passing out pamphlets, trying to set up Bible studies. Uh, that's, that was the beginning of, of our relationship, and I definitely think God had, had a hand in that. Anyway, we'll finish this up next week, Lord willing. Thank you.